A reading from the first letter of St. John. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also must love one another. No one has ever seen God, yet if we love one another, God remains in us and his love is brought to perfection in us. This is how we know that we remain in him and he in us, that he has given us of his spirit. Moreover, we have seen and testify that the Father sent his Son as Savior of the world. Whoever acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him and he in God. We have come to know and to believe in the love God has for us. God is love, and whoever remains in love remains in God and God in him. And this is love brought to perfection among us, that we have confidence on the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. And so one who fears is not yet perfect in love. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Lord, every nation on earth will adore you. Lord, every nation on earth will adore you. O God, with your judgment endow the king, and with your justice the king's son. He shall govern your people with justice, and your afflicted ones with judgment. Lord, every nation on earth will adore you. The kings of Tarshish and the isles shall offer gifts. The kings of Arabia and Seba shall bring tribute. Lord, every nation on earth will adore you. For he shall rescue the poor when he cries out, and the afflicted when he has no one to help him. He shall have pity for the lowly and the poor. The lives of the poor he shall save. Lord, Lord, every nation on earth will adore you. Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundo Marco. Gloria After the five thousand had eaten and were satisfied, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and precede him to the other side toward Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And when he had taken leave of them, he went off to the mountain to pray. When it was evening, the boat was far out on the sea, and he was alone on shore. Then he saw that they were tossed about while rowing, for the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he came toward them walking on the sea. He meant to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. They had all seen him and were terrified. But at, won't, at once he spoke with them, Take courage, it is I, 
Do not be afraid. He got into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely astounded. They had not understood the incident of the loaves. On the contrary, their hearts were hardened. Er pom to ar mini, If there is one great theme that Holy Mother Church places before us in these liturgical celebrations pitted between the celebration of the epiphany of our Lord and the baptism of our Lord, is the fact that God is always in search of the individual. He calls the individual constantly to himself. In fact, this is a very strong theme in the opening paragraphs of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, that God is in search of the individual. He calls the individual to himself. We see this in the lives of the prophets of the Old Testament, for example, especially Isaiah and Hosea. Spousal imagery is used, for example. So God calls us constantly to himself. And in the liturgical readings of this week, we have the great theme of love of God. In the first reading from the first letter of John chapter 3 and chapter 4 that we hear from this week as the first reading of the sacred liturgy. And then we see the miracles of Jesus in the Gospels in this week's liturgies between the epiphany and the baptism of the Lord. He cures the lepers, the paralytics, the possessed. In yesterday's Gospel was the great miracle of the loaves. God constantly going outside of himself. He fed 5,000 in yesterday's Gospel. Today we see him going out again to assist the apostles, the disciples in the boat. As soon as he enters the boat, the wind dies down. And there's a very haunting line in today's gospel. It's, it's haunting for me. It's, it's, it's always kind of been a line that's difficult to ponder. Today's gospel at the end makes it clear that the hearts were hardened at the miracle of the loaves. And now they're astounded that they see Jesus walking on water. They're seeing him perform these miracles, his own disciples, his own apostles. And they're disturbed by these actions of his because they're so supernatural. They're above nature, supernatural. And these things are astounding, huh? But it doesn't negate the fact that God constantly goes out to the person to seek them, to assist them. And in this theme on love from the first reading that we've heard from all week from the first letter of John, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God wants a filial relationship with the individual. That is a relationship of, of sonship or daughtership, a child, as opposed to a servile relationship. The first letter of John makes this very clear. God doesn't want slaves. God wants sons and daughters. A filial relationship with the individual as opposed to a servile relationship with the individual. And yet so many of us don't know when God is speaking to us as a loving father. An all going out loving father who seeks his son or daughter back to himself. We remain stubborn because of maybe our temperament that is natural to us, that we're not training. Some are choleric, some are phlegmatic, some are melancholic, some are sanguine. Even being a sanguine can get you into trouble in not following God as you should be following God. It could be because of any number of issues, dependencies, or addictions. We don't always discern properly when and if God is speaking to us. So I'd like to share with you six very, very basic points. I call them general principles. And I want to make that point very strongly because these six points are by no means, my brothers and sisters, an exhaustive list. For example, in this list, nowhere is spiritual direction mentioned. And it's good to have spiritual direction, especially with a major decision in your life. So these six points are very basic. They're just general principles, how to discern if God is speaking to you. Because again, even in today's gospel, the apostles, the disciples 
are disturbed by Jesus' works in their lives. They didn't understand the multiplication of the loaves. They don't understand the calming of the waters in their boat that was being tossed about. They didn't recognize Jesus at first in the walking on the water. These supernatural events disturbed them. And so if, if they can't get the message, <laughs> and they were his own disciples, then it's going to be difficult for us to always get the message. So we need these basic principles. huh? Number one, this is how you can know if God is speaking to you. That the idea, whether it be a spiritual idea or a more temporal idea, may be a possible job change. Okay, so this is in the spiritual realm and the temporal realm, the secular realm, what I'm about to share with you. How to discern if God is speaking to you. Number one, the idea is in accord with sacred scripture as upheld by both sacred tradition and the magisterium of the church. Number one, ipso facto. In other words, there's no point that would be against church teaching in regards to the so-called three-legged stool, sacred scripture, sacred tradition, or the magisterium. The idea is in accord, the idea that you're having, is in accord with sacred scripture as upheld by both sacred tradition and the magisterium of the church. Nothing immoral, for example. That's just one facet. No immorality in your idea. Number two, the idea involves an element of faith. And at the same time, it strengthens your faith. So it not only involves faith, but it strengthens your faith. Number three, the idea comes to you when? While praying. That's number three. The idea comes to you while praying. Number four, the idea fosters your personal interior and exterior charity towards others. And at the same time, it fosters hope within you. In other words, it doesn't make you wound up like a rubber band. It gives you interior and exterior charity. And it fosters hope from within you. Number five, the idea is often repeated within your intellect, while at the same time, it is in accord with human reason. And it brings you great peace throughout the day. The idea is often repeated within your intellect, while at the same time it is in accord with human reason and it brings you great peace. And number six, the idea grows stronger within you over time. The idea grows stronger within you over time. Now I will post these six points on my personal missionary page at the Fathers of Mercy website at fathersofmercy.com. You would then click on missionaries, then click on my name, Father Wade Menezes, and scroll down to some different PDF files I have listed there. And one of them will be, quote, how to discern if God is speaking to you, some general principles to consider. Pope Francis recently said, in the Bible, God always appears as the one who takes the initiative with the person in the encounter with the individual. There you have it. God calls us constantly to himself. Pope Francis continues, God seeks us, and usually God seeks us precisely while we are in the bitter and tragic moment of betraying him and fleeing from him. God does not wait in seeking us, but seeks us out immediately. God is a patient seeker, he is our father. Again, that filial relationship. He is not our master in the servile sense. God doesn't want slaves. He wants sons and daughters. In the Bible, God always appears as the one who takes the initiative with the person in the encounter with us. God seeks us. And usually God seeks us precisely while we are in the bitter and tragic moment of betraying God and fleeing from him. God does not wait in seeking us, but seeks us out immediately. God is a patient seeker. He is our Father. Now, who's a great model for all of this in the purely human sense? St. Joseph. We focus a lot on the Christ child, and appropriately so during this time between Epiphany and the baptism of the Lord. We focus a lot on our Blessed Mother, and appropriately so, but sometimes St. Joseph gets put on the back burner 
And that can be unfortunate. Pope Francis says, salvation came to us from the yes uttered by a lowly maiden from a small town on the fringes of a great empire. Let us allow ourselves to be warmed by the tenderness of God. And that's exactly what St. Joseph did. Think about it. Talk about trusting in God, trusting in the tenderness of God, letting God grab you when God is reaching out to you, when God is taking the initiative with you, letting him grab you. St. Joseph discovers that his betrothed is with child, knowing full well that he is not the father. Number two, St. Joseph is faithful to an angel's message to, quote, not be afraid to, make, to take Mary as your wife. Number three, there's no room at the inn for them to have the child. Instead, Joseph must settle for an animal's manger in a cold cave. Number four, Joseph is then attentive to an angel's second message to flee into Egypt with the mother and child precisely because a madman, Herod, is seeking the child's destruction and death. Now, <laughs> if you're a sacred author writing scripture and providing the great story about the great Messiah, is this the story you're going to use? <laughs> no, not from a merely human point of view. This is not the story you would use to tell of the origins of a great Messiah? No way. This is how we know that the sacred incarnation of our God is historical fact, because the sacred authors were inspired by the historicity of the Gospels, by the historicity of Scripture. Dr. Warren Carroll, who founded Christendom College in Front Royal, Virginia, one of his most famous quotes, he would say it over and over again, and I might have said this in a previous homily, but it's worth repeating. He would say frequently, quote, truth exists, the incarnation happened, period. Quote, end quote. Truth exists, the incarnation happened. In fact, at the gift shop at Christendom College, you can buy mugs <laughs> with this quote on it, with Dr. Carroll's uh, image or, or effigy on it. We have one at the Fathers of Mercy at our refectory. Truth exists, the incarnation happened. To think of the origins of our great Messiah, the God-man Jesus Christ, and what his parents went through. Is this the story you would use if you were a sacred author, from a merely human standpoint, that is, to tell the story of the great Messiah coming to the world? No. A manger with animals? being refused to enter the inn to have your child, fleeing from a madman who wants to kill your child. Pope Francis says, St. Joseph always listened to God's voice. St. Joseph was deeply sensitive to God's secret will. St. Joseph was attentive to the messages that came to him from the depths of his heart and from on high. St. Joseph did not persist in following his own plan for his life or allow bitterness to poison his soul when these negative situations came before him. Rather, St. Joseph was ready to make himself available to the news that, in such a bewildering way, was being presented to him concerning Mary and the child. By accepting himself according to God's design, Joseph fully finds himself. He finds himself beyond himself, letting God take control. His freedom to renounce even what is his, the possession of his very life, and his full interior availability to the will of God challenge us and show us the way. Pope Francis continues, Our filial relationship with God is not like a treasure that we keep in the corner of our life only staring at it, but doing nothing with it. No. It must be increased. It must be nourished every day with listening to the Word of God, with prayer, with participation in the sacraments, especially the sacraments of reconciliation and the Eucharist, and by fostering human love. 
This is how we let God take control of our lives. Listening to the word of God with prayer, with participation in the sacraments, especially with reconciliation in the Eucharist, and with fostering human love. Let Joseph be our guide. Huh? There's a title in St. Joseph's Litany that I love personally. It's St. Joseph, Terror of Demons. Pray for us. Why is he referred to as Terror of Demons in his own litany? I believe it's the second to the last title in his litany. There's a scriptural reason and a non-scriptural reason for this. Number one, the scriptural reason is because he successfully fled Herod and his cohorts in crime when Herod ordered the massacre of the innocents of the males two years of age and younger. Joseph indeed fled to Egypt successfully, safely with Mary and the child. And this ticked the devils off. This made the demons very upset that Joseph was successful in this regard. St. Joseph, terror of demons, pray for us. And the non-scriptural reason why St. Joseph is referred to as terror of demons is because of the very, very strong sacred tradition that when he died, he was flanked on either side of his deathbed by both the Blessed Virgin Mary, his betrothed, and his foster son, the God-man Jesus Christ. This is why St. Joseph precisely is the patron saint of a happy death because of that strong tradition that holds that he was flanked by Mary and Jesus when he died. The devils couldn't get to him to tempt him in the final moments of his earthly life. No way. And that ticked the devils off. St. Joseph, terror of demons, pray for us. God bless you.